Hello. So in this video we're going to go through James and the religious situation at the time. And this might have to be in three videos because there's quite a lot to go through. There's 22 years of religion when religion was a big thing. So I'll try and get through it as fast as we can. But yeah, so enjoy. So if we first look at the religious situation in 1603 when James's reign started. So he came after Elizabeth I who was quite lenient with religion in the sense that she just wanted people to conform and wasn't that bothered about individual beliefs as long as they kind of went to church and had outward conformity, that was okay with her. And she established the Elizabethan religious settlement in 1559, which was kind of like Anglicanism and kind of established it within the country and wanted people to follow it outwardly. James was brought up as a Presbyterian in Scotland, which is a kind of like a form of Calvinism which is what his theology always was, so even coming into England and being the monarch in England, he still had a Calvinist theology, so he believed in things like double predestination, for example, but his in his practices, he was very much an Anglican when he came to England, so Protestant and conformed with most people in England at that time, and like Elizabeth, because he's kind of like Rex Pacificus and all this stuff, he was quite peaceful, he was quite lenient, he just wanted people to openly conform to Anglicanism in England, and wasn't that bothered about what people's actual beliefs were, just as so long as they were like respectful and went to church and promoted Anglicanism in that way. And then in England at that time, it was mostly Anglicans, that was the main form of religion. There was also quite a few Puritans who were like a more extreme form of Anglicanism, so want things like symbols to be gone, so like they don't want the rings in marriages, stuff like that, and they focus more on sermons. And then there was only a very small majority of Catholics but there was still a big kind of bias towards them. People were still very hateful and hostile towards Catholics because of the fact that it was so different to their religion and also because of things like the Spanish Armada, which wasn't that long ago, people had like built resentment for Spanish people, which translates to Catholicism. I think coming into England, people were instantly quite suspicious of James being not a Catholic, but a Catholic sympathiser because his wife, Anne of Denmark, was a Roman Catholic. So that kind of started off the Popish conspiracy, which we start to see develop through James's reign and then more so through Charles's. I think the Puritans felt that they'd been treated unsympathetically during Elizabeth's reign and the fact that any man that was coming in now it poses a good opportunity for people to try and quickly influence James with their views and hope that he will make reforms that are better suited to them. So if we now look at the Hampton Court Conference, which was in 1604, so a year after the Millenaire Petition, and it was James's practical response to try and bring consensus between the Puritans and then his bishops, to try and like, work out a way that they can work together in the future. I think James was quite excited about this because he had a sort of passion for like philosophical and ideological debate, he was very into that sort of thing because he had quite a strong education in that sense. So I think he wanted this opportunity to share his knowledge and share his expertise in the sense. And so the Puritans are very quick to organise lawyers like that, draw up bills in which show their reforms, what they wanted, what they wanted to eradicate in the church. So if we firstly look at Puritans in England at this time and how they influenced and shaped policy and just like affected the balance in England, we can first look at the millinery petition in 1603, which was presented to James on his route to London and was signed supposedly by a thousand Puritan ministers. And so it had key demands in how they wanted James to reform the church. So things like priests wearing vestments, things like more emphasis on sermons and preaching. Ultimately just wanted to set up a more Puritan based church that felt more aligned to them and their beliefs and I think the interesting part is that James like considered to look at these proposals which he did in the Hampton Court Conference which we'll look at in a minute. James was quite smart in the sense though that he only invited more moderate, moderately known Puritans to this debate so people such as John Reynolds who was quite a big influence in this and so this meant there was no radical ideas coming in and it was Puritans who wanted change, who would promote change but were also conformists. So they wanted things such as like the doctrine of the church to be carried out more purity. They didn't want bowing when Jesus' name was spoke. Wanted ministers to act according to the word of God, that kind of thing, you know. But then James had already been quite practical before the conference in addressing some of these things. 
he'd already spoke out about the general failing of the public to observe the Sabbath with kind of like respect and dignity, which is like Sunday, like the holy day and stuff like that. And he also wanted to produce a more learned clergy. So like people in the church, people like expertise on the Bible and stuff like that. So just like make a more effective congregation. But then there was quite a few clashes recorded. There's quite a few <laughs> quite a few clashes recorded throughout the conference. So there was like the key moment where Reynolds referred to Presbyters, which I think triggered James a bit, coming from Scotland and being brought up with the Presbyterians because they were more strict in the church and especially more strict when it came to hierarchy to things like bishops, which James liked having bishops because they were a symbol of the hierarchy that he supported, being a monarch and being part of the hierarchy. So he famously declared, no bishop, no king. So just to try and enforce the fact that the Puritans could not make any radical changes and James was very strict in the fact that it wanted to keep the church hierarchy how it was. And the note taker for the day referred to in his notes about how James' mood completely switched after the mention of the Presbyterian became a lot more cold, a lot more serious. So then that just showed how how little the Puritans really had regarding power in this conference, where they were never actually going to get big things passed because James would be so hostile towards it. So things like the mention of Presbyterian, which only slightly indicated to the removal of bishops, was a no-go. So if we now look at the outcome of the Hampton Court Conference, I think most would say that it wasn't that successful, minus obviously the King James Bible, which was published in 1611, which was agreed upon at the Hampton Court Conference, was a massive achievement, I think, for James and for all the translators involved, because it was a massive work. He had 50 plus translators working on it. It was by Oxford and Cambridge, and their translators combined, which is quite interesting. It was deeply like scholarly, like it was something that took years and years to produce, like they got the best translators to do it. It was quite a literary work in the fact that things were like purposely worded in ways to make them sound more elegant and more beautiful. And also it was a political work, I think, for James because he could move out things such as like ideas of kings as tyrants and then he kind of removed them or edited them in ways like that to make it sound not like all monarchs were tyrants. And also, he purposely got some Puritans to be involved in the making of the Bible to make it feel more like their Bible. So they feel like their kind of grievances had been addressed with that when they used to feel like involved in the church in England. But then if we look at how many reforms were actually... Um, like, and the, the reforms that Puritans asked for that were actually delivered on, it was quite limited. Like, they got a few things that they wanted but while that was quite easy to agree to, because James was quite happy to do that, there was a lot of grievances that were harder to address. So first, just for practical reasons, so stuff like when the Puritans worked to get rid of pluralism, so like having key ministers be in charge of like multiple churches in the country, Puritans wanted to get rid of that, but then didn't have enough money to pay so many different ministers, so that couldn't really be solved because they didn't have the funds for it, essentially. And yes, yeah, so a lot of reforms didn't take place with Puritans. So things such as the surplus, he wanted that to go. But even though James said no to that and said that ministers had to wear the surplus, it was a lot more leniently enforced in the fact where if they didn't want to wear the surplus, they didn't actually have to wear it. They just had to conform in other ways. But like legally, yes, you did. So nothing much really changed. However, people like Reynolds and the moderates think so far it was a success because they still got to air their opinions and the other platform to share their views. But I still think it was pretty much dominated by James and it's what he wanted that would go. And then the thing is that the little reforms they asked for, I think James called them like matters indifferent or something like that. Like he didn't think that what they asking for was important enough to make the effort to make the change. But then obviously any big radical ideas of change, like scrapping bishops, mm -mm, no bishops, no king, won't happen. So now we can move on and look at more changes to Puritan ways of life in England. So in 1604, Bancroft was made Archbishop of Canterbury, which was notable as he was pretty much an anti-Puritan and he opposed any kind of Puritan reforms that were coming in. And he was quite forceful on anything that they wanted to change. So, for example, he released a book of canons which stated that the clergy had to subscribe to the 39 articles and the prayer book. They had to accept the king as the head of the church and stuff like that. And they had to make sure they enforced 
hierarchy of bishops and were conforming to that. And so about 90, about 90 Puritan clergy members lost their positions after this because they wouldn't conform to it. But it just shows how whoever, put, whoever James puts in positions of power can really influence the shift in religion in England and what's allowed and what's not. Because as soon as he was made Archbishop of Canterbury, suddenly there was a lot of um, imposing of rules against Puritans. But as we'll see in a minute, a different minister can have a different effect. So in 1610, James made George Abbott Archbishop of Canterbury, which was a total juxtaposition from Bancroft because he was an evangelical Calvinist. So he was a lot more sympathetic towards the Puritan cause and he imposed reforms that actually favoured Puritans. So for example, he wouldn't prosecute any Puritans who objected to any popish aspects in the church, things like kneeling down in the word Jesus and stuff like that. And especially if they were good preachers because that's what's important to Puritans. So it's what's important to George Abbott as well. He didn't enforce the 39 Articles, which Puritans didn't like because it was too Anglican. And also with the Book of Sports, which we'll come to in a minute, he opposed the Book of Sports and tried to influence James to not enforce it. Okay. And also he was important where he was the person who introduced George Villiers, aka Duke of Buckingham, to court. So we'll get onto that later, but that's fun. <laughs> and also George Abbott declined from influence because he accidentally killed a gamekeeper in 1621. So that's also very fun. And then in 1618, James published the Book of Sports, which was significant because it was a list of sports that couldn't be played on the Sabbath, so on Sunday. And so Puritans Okay, so for Puritans this would be important to them because they don't want sports on Sundays because it's the Holy Day, it's the Sabbath, they want it to be pure and just about the Bible and them. But the Book of Sports only banned certain sports, I think like bear baiting or some, something like that. But there was still a lot of sports that people could play on the Sabbath, so things like archery, dances, stuff like that were still allowed. I think because James thought it was better for people to be playing sports and being occupied on a Sunday in more healthy manners other than doing things like going drinking and you know, talking about the government and making conspiracies and trying to revolt on them. <laughs> so yeah, Puritans were really unhappy with Book of Sports because it made the Sabbath, in their opinion, unholy. And like I said a minute ago, someone like George Abbott would also disapprove of it and try to discourage James from publishing it and enforcing it. I don't think it was that strictly enforced, but again it just shows how um, like favour of a certain religious denomination can go in and out in favour. So there's things like Abbott being made at Canterbury, which really heightened the Puritan cause. It kind of made them more active in England and could be more influential. But then when things like because sports are published, it diminishes them. So kind of it's interesting to look at like the power balance and stuff with the different sectors of religion in England at the time. 